Hello everyone. Hello everyone and most welcome to 2103. This is going to be a tryout, first little improvisation of an open discussion between me and Kalle. And later we might have another participant joining us. We are going to keep it very light. And uh, the theme for today is an improvisation about how did we encounter quantum mechanics or quantum physics without being overly specific what sort of obstacles has been there for us or how have we approached it and uh, also during the years we've been trying out with quantum mechanics for quite some time here and the development uh, what inspired me a bit was that a friend of mine today suggested that he can accept quantum mechanics but he cannot believe it and i <laughs> i felt that to be incredibly fitting it's like very hard to believe in it because it's most definitely contra-intuitive it is uh, contra-logic most definitely it goes against our rationality no doubt one could sort of say that quantum mechanics came to show that reality does not follow our thinking lines or rationality devices rather reality is starkly different from our reality our thinking mental reality and it, in a way i don't know in that it makes some sense if you really think about it quite hard because why would why would reality as we discovered in as discovered in quantum mechanics why would that sort of have to adjust to our rationality that has a history going back 2,500 years with the Greek development there, with the philosophers of nature and so on. Why would that follow the law of the excluded middle, for instance? <laughs> it is almost a bit preposterous to suggest that it should have fit like hand in glove. It's asking a bit too much. Going a bit over the top. And uh, although it's a very what can you say? Shocking understanding, almost a revelation that the reality is so different from our everyday intuitions about how things should go on. It's also a humbling thing. Maybe not on a personal level, but on a humane, universal level. Why would reality adopt to our singularly humane visions what we think about everything? It's a bit, what should one say? It's a bit 
Hmm. A bit over the top that we think everything has to adjust to us. Could be like into, I wouldn't say megalomania, but <laughs> human experience cannot come first, or at least human rationality. And one, uh, I think the most pertinent thing that we always come back to in these lectures is the questioning of uh, the excluded middle. Because that's the thing that's not even in commune with most languages or it's more Western, so it doesn't even fit with most of the Earth's population. And previously, when we looked into Frank Bilcek, he also goes in to say that our measuring devices often gets confused with reality itself. We have tools much needed for our technical development, for our progress. But for instance, three dimensions are things very helpful to do calculations to make devices to build a bridge to make a building they are absolutely sine qua non absolutely necessary but does that mean that they are reality no they were so obviously constructed for instance in the theory of newton in his writing desk without much contact with a an external observable reality or any like great intermeshing into reality. But still absolutely real. And that's, I mean, that's part of the problem that many of what is very helpful for us, useful, definitely classical physics is without any comparison whatsoever, the most helpful, useful thing that ever come to, came to humanity. And it has utterly changed life for most of humanity. It has multiplied the outcome of one working hour 17 times. That is 1,700%. It's pretty incredible. No wonder that we come to admire and, and sort of, what do you say, confuse the tools because we as laymen, the only thing we see are the tools of the trade. What is being used. To make these advantages, but those are not reality itself. And uh, as we might know from the wheeler devitt equation, one of the most pertinent in quantum mechanics, there is no, uh, not the, we don't have the factor time, nor do we have the factor space. They are not fundamentals. The event is the fundamental. We would see the using times, but it, using time, but it's more of a tool. We are helped with it. It's it's good for us.
that it's not reality itself. And it could even be so implied by quantum mechanics. We can't even tell what reality is. But what quantum mechanics did was most definitely show that the two are not reality, three dimensions and arithmetic geometric two is not reality. Why would it be? <laughs> it was constructed, for instance, by René Descartes. Why would that oddly be exactly the same thing as reality? Doesn't make much sense, does it? See, I'm going to let my colleague here for this open, improvised discussion about how we encountered quantum mechanics. I hope his connection is good enough. Should we give it a try, Kelly Lundahl? Yes, 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 yes. So the opening premise was your reference remark, I can accept quantum physics. but not believe it. Yeah. So this is the, we could say it's like a, the dichotomy between science and God, for instance. I can accept it, science, but I don't believe it. Mm, yeah. Uh, and I, I can um, uh, repeat it for the benefit of uh, our friend Asia. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you. That yeah, we are discussing. Yeah. Most welcome to the discussion. We are talking lightly here about how we encountered quantum mechanics the first time, or uh, okay. how we've been struggling yeah. with it, if you like. <laughs> right, right, right. Very interesting. Yes, thank you. So the premise is an affirmation by a friend of Hans, uh, that is, who said, "I can accept quantum physics." but not believe it. That is, I can accept quantum physics, but not believe it. So oh, I would yeah. say that is a little bit like uh, the dichotomy between science and God. So let's say uh, that people can accept science, uh, but they don't necessarily believe in it. Uh, oh. they, they do believe it, of course, but, but it's... Um, <clears throat> But uh, science is nothing that you believe in. It is a thing for the heart. A science is about the brain, so to say. This is the old dichotomy uh, from classical physics. And I could uh, quickly show um, this paper that we have been discussing. Um, by P PNR about cubism and relation of quantum mechanics compared. <clears throat> uh, the point was that, uh, let me go down one of the points here, which is uh, here, the second point. The quantum state is of uh, epistemic character. It represents information, knowledge, and beliefs. In other words, this is hugely important. Quantum physics doesn't make a, uh, a distinction between information, facts, or beliefs. That um, let's say that the, in Sweden, for instance, in the 1940s, we had this um, big discussion, which affirmed that science is science and, and beliefs is for the church. Uh, but this quantum physics shows that there, you, there cannot be any uh, distinction between, let's say, facts uh, and beliefs. That is, we, we, we learn in the school wrongly that facts are one thing, 
and believes are one thing or another thing. But quantum physics doesn't separate them. Would you agree with that, Hans? <clears throat> yeah, sure, yeah. yeah it's like, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's like, it's hard to believe, but you have to accept. <laughs> <laughs> It's like we have a way of life that is, we mentioned earlier that uh, in a couple of lectures, uh, that language is so classical. I think science, yeah, we also talked about that today, that science itself is uh, largely quantum mechanical. Oh, sorry, sorry, classical. Uh, we spoke about uh, Mac Halliday and his view on reality uh, is that it's governed by language and language is classical and uh, I won't go into the boring details uh, but uh, that we make nouns out of verbs and that's also tools yeah yeah you can say that as I said before uh, I mentioned that the Newtonian tools are often confused by our light, uh, we lay people as being reality itself. For instance, three dimensions. We need to have this helpful too. And uh, I gladly admit, yeah, 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 <laughs> of course, uh, uh, until I really uh, dwell deeply into quantum mechanics are confused also uh, the tools of the trade with reality itself. Where now can I get a grip more of a grip of it? Well, where on earth will these three dimensions be outside of myself and from where? Where from where would the origin start in the three dimensions of Descartes? So a bit once you start to open up for it, uh, it becomes more and more obvious. Mm, my Lloyd, this is really way out there. It's very hard to, to get a grip on with the usual tools and I think I mentioned once upon a time my, my first course where I met upon quantum mechanics at the university, a small course, people were screaming against the lecture. That cannot be true. <laughs> I think it's so ingrained. It's in our, uh, it's in our uh, backbone. It's part of the fundamentals. It's... Uh, so great part of language as explained by Mac. So we, we get it already before we are conscious of it. I would say at the age of uh, four or five, nominalization is already present. And science is classical. There is still to this day, quantum mechanics is expressed in classical physical terms. There's no other way. Science is normalization. We cannot construct a new science because science is this. And of course, <laughs> this will even further that I, I'll have to accept it. I can't believe it. I don't have words really to express it. Well, what would you say, good, old, good folks? Kal and Ash, Asya. I could continue. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, quantum physics is a challenge for humanities. Um, okay, humanities can accept it uh, that this is this is science, but they don't believe it. In other words, uh, they keep quantum physics outside of sci uh, of humanities. Mm, yeah. Uh, and there is, uh, they still uh, all reason in classical way. Uh, let's say in my field, in manuscripts, when you want to, uh, 
let's just say establish the text of the New Testament. Well, I have been studying this in detail. So it's always a question, is this the text original uh, or something like that? But this is not so how science works, the real science, uh, whether a text is original, whether uh, Mark uh, wrote this or not. Rather, the science uh, is in, like in the Schrodinger's cat, it's in it's, uh, three states or something like that. Before the observation, uh, let's say that um, the text uh, is, uh, is answered and whether it is true or not, uh, then you should also reflect it in the, the, uh, the edition uh, when you produce it. Uh, so you cannot say the question of whether a text is original or is not is not relevant. It's about observation. Each observe, like in quantum physics, it's each observation decides something. So it's not about uh, at let's say an out uh, let's say an editor who decides makes an observation once and for all and decides it. No, it's each reader, each observation which oh, decides yeah. whether a text. Each observation, each no. No, uh, <laughs> the problem with humanity is this uh, is has been reduced. This has been eliminated. So the reader in humanities uh, has become passive uh, because an editor per, uh, has taken all the decisions for him or her. Um, has already established whether this text is original or not, but uh, real science doesn't discuss whether, let's say, Schrodinger's cat is original or not. That is a, a ridiculous question. Instead, no, what Schrodinger pointed out is the observation which decides everything what is relevant, and this is not uh, relevant humanities. <clears throat> Does our uh, guest Asia want to say something? Well, yeah, and I, I suggest you, you, you take away the book. So, in the, <laughs> it's so it's so interesting listening to the discussion. I I'm not that familiar with the intricacies of quantum physics, but I'm just thinking: Does this require a new concept of truth? Because we have these standard ideas of what truth is, you know, truth is representation, truth is, you know, coherence and consistency. And, uh, you know, there are all these different theories of what counts as true. And I wonder what is the meaning of truth in the context of quantum physics? Absolutely. I could actually say well, this what relates to what I just said. Um, humanities, uh, it's very important, the question about original. The original stands for the truth, like the platonic truth that is mm -hmm. out uh, somewhere in the, um, what do you call it, in the platonic idea, uh, platonic world of ideas. The truth is over there and we must recuperate it. There can be only one truth, one only one original. Well, I mean, not necessarily. There are like pragmatic theories of truth that says truth is whatever works in practice and so on. They don't commit to any particular, you know, like outlook or something that's fixed. So there are more flexible ideas of truth. I just wonder what counts as a true statement in quantum physics. Like how is that even defined? How do people, you know, come to an agreement that something is the case in quantum physics? Yeah, uh, if I can say something that, uh, please. I think Halliday uh, says something that cannot be another scientific language. It's a way we. Because today, what developed during the 18th century was classical uh, physics, and mm -hmm. this is what we see, see today as the, the gold standard, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and this is how we express in all uh, different uh, 
subjects what truth is, the idea of truth is that we have a statement and that corresponds to something that is either true or false. And that does indeed follow the law of the excluded middle mm -hmm. uh, and, and many other things. So I'd say that Halliday say we were pretty much stuck <laughs> with the expression it's excused with classical physics and most of the dissertations papers about quantum mechanics is and has to have, have to be expressed in, in classical terms although it's, there's no connection to the classical the language is classical mm -hmm. so uh, I maybe I guess starting from holidays that we are the language most probably have to remain in the way it is and uh, we have good use for it mm -hmm. very practical uh, man maybe it's a bit of a warning finger do not confuse what is practical with what is real somehow or mm -hmm. the outmost truth that we can't reach the outmost truth or reality we can't we can't actually describe it so to speak mm -hmm. Somewhere there, <laughs> I'm struggling for the words. <laughs> right, right. Please forgive me, Asya. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I, if if I'm getting the idea, then you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> uh, could, could I? Could you uh, be closer to the microphone? Uh, I have a bit hard hearing you. Me? Yeah, I'll better now. Better now. Is it better? better? Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm closer to the mic of the computer now. Very good. Very good. Thanks. Uh, I was also maybe we could talk uh, how we how it was to first encounter quantum mechanics. I I can try to cut it short. I probably told you those times before, but uh, the first time I encountered it, it was a very shocking experience. Huh. It was very close to what Niels Bohr said that if you're not utterly shocked by quantum mechanics, you haven't even begun to understand it. <laughs> 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 and I think that is a very good mark. And I, I, I was shocked. I, did, I didn't, uh, I would not say that I did, digested it at mm -hmm. all. It took years, decades, to even get a little bit closer to it. Uh, yeah, definitely, I would say it, it took years and decades. And as my friend mentioned, it's more of an acceptance that you can't define or have models for everything and that these models, the truths we have are, yeah, that's they, they are tools. They're not reality itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, maybe one good point there, I, sh I should give the word over to Kanda or you, Asya, uh, is of course that the law of the excluded middle, which has been uh, for millennia the, the gold standard for any statement that cannot be contradictory, we mm -hmm. know that not to be true on quantum mechanics. Uh, yeah. The law of excluding it is proven false <laughs> by observation. It's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, it is because it turns upside down logic too, because this is part of logical thinking, classical logic, that the law of the excluded third. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, when I studied logic. Uh, I never heard any voice singing about uh, that the law of the excluded middle should be wrong or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist at that time. It, since then, it's come um, a Graham priest with paraconsisted logic or dialethism, dialethism and so on. But uh, only merely 25 years ago, it's you, you can hear about it in at least not in Sweden, the, uh, the universities there. Right. I mean, we, the only the only philosopher that I think comes close to this type of thinking would be Hegel with his mm. dialectics, because mm. he talks about the unity of the opposites and so on. So he yeah. doesn't 
doesn't think in terms of the formal classical logic of the no. middle and so on. Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, uh, opposites complement each other. We we don't have a total view of everything. That's also one thing that and mm -hmm. uh, the two things that are in quantum mechanics are the most greatest contradictions that there are in reality. <laughs> Wave and particle, nothing could be more opposite. But still, mm -hmm. they make up reality. There is no one model of the world because of that. Mm -hmm. never be. Yeah. Uh, so let me tell you about my experience. Yeah. So, uh, I encountered yes. quantum physics to 2018 when I met Hans, this Hans here. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. But I think I was, I, I think unlike most people, I wasn't shocked by quantum physics. I think I was always quantum physical. <laughs> ah, okay, great. Now, uh, let me tell you why. Because uh, some 10 years earlier, around 2007, 2006, when I was uh, working on my PhD thesis in Ancient Creek, I was holding a seminar. Um, they were sitting professors, doctors uh, in Ancient Creek and Latin. Uh, when I say, said that, when I affirmed that this passage in this poem could be interpreted equally in two or three different ways, We, uh, we cannot say that one is necessarily better than the other. They were almost shocked, uh, <laughs> aghast of this affirmation, uh, because classical physics reasons that only one, or also that Aristotle excluded the middle reasons that only one possible interpretation can be true. Oh, yeah. And I think that would destroy poetry. <laughs> and that's what happens at universities that poetry is destroyed. Because you read so for Andy Sotel. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did love, uh, I did read the whole on poetry, Paris Sotel, when I did my doctoral studies and enjoyed it, it's great. But still, uh, Aristotle, you cannot really use Aristotle in that way, uh, presuming that there is only one possible interpretation of a poem or one passage in a poem. Uh, so it's, it's still today, I encounter uh, recently distinguished professors in humanities uh, <clears throat> that, that say that only one interpretation is possible of a certain passage. And they, they write, uh, so they, they, you can have one paper affirming this word in Bindar, I can mean on one thing, and the next paper says the opposite, and then comes the third paper that says the same position. But this is ridiculous, because uh, let's say quantum physics shows that uh, like using certain scatters example, that um, before observation, there is a uh, juxtaposition where the cat is in three positions, dead, alive, and both positions, both positions at the same time, that is, you have three positions of the cat. That's like, I think, poetry also works. Before each observation, you have um, uh, three interpretations. Uh, let's give me a uh, concrete example. Uh, so Pindar, like a skilled poet would do, he gets paid to praise, uh, let's say, a king of, Syrac of Sicily, Syracusa. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this one single phrase, Pindar, he, he can praise his king, but then he also praises with the same phrase himself. And with the third bird, he kills three birds with one stone. He also pra praises Sicily. So, with one single expression, Pindar kills three birds with one stone. <laughs> While most specialists want to say, no, he, he Pindar, he, he was only to kill one bird with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no, I, I think the, uh, to, to, to understand Schrodinger's cat is a very good, um, this metaphor about three birds with one stone is a very good, because actually, what is this cat? Yes. When the observation comes, then you actually kill, you get only one bird 
the, with one stop. You have actually three cats in the box. <laughs> or three birds if you want. That sounds that pretty crowded. Cats. <laughs> I'm I'm really surprised by this interesting story story that you just uh, told us uh, tell, told us about Kala. How is it that all these humanities professors could be so simple minded? I don't understand. Ever since there is such a thing as hermeneutics, and there are writers like Gadamer, and then later on Derrida. In philosophy, it's been taken for granted that, you know, a text has multiple meanings that go well beyond the single interpretation, even of, of its own author. So I'm really shocked to see that, you know, to hear that professors in the humanities may think that there is Absolutely, one. Absolutely, I'm also shocked. Um, but, but okay, so... Absolutely. So let me use Gadamer. He did a, a fantastic um service to humanities mm -hmm. and and people use and use Gadamer to show that now the interpret the reader is active so to say yeah to understand. yeah 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 but yeah. i would say that Gadam that that didn't actually happen he took only a half step why so because still in the humanities works when you want to publish a scientific text the editor already makes all, this, all, all the decisions in advance for the reader. Let's make give me a banal example. Let's say that uh, Marcel Proust, he he wrote uh, two versions of his book, and then <clears throat> say that the editor chooses, let's say, the first edition yeah. to publish it as a scientific text. But but the problem is that. And then the, uh, the reader doesn't have an option to choose the ed edition number two. Um, instead, you should give that option. You should make the uh, reader active, really active, only when the editor's role has been reduced to a minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, that right. is when, he, when you are really in this uh, uh, position of a. Uh, observing is running a scat, if you understand, before, um, let's say that you actually have, let's say Marcel Proust two uh, editions of his work, the inside this box. So the reader should be able to freely choose them uh, uh, in each case, in each reading. Mm. Instead of the editor picking, let's say, edition of it one, that is the problem. So oh. even if you accept, Karami did a wonderful work, but it's not applied uh, practically. <clears throat> but but, the, the most... but why? Why? Are, but I think we don't need to necessarily need to be worried about the editions. We should be thinking about the meaning, the multiple meanings within each edition. So no matter which edition the editor picks, it doesn't preclude the the reader from, you know, making different sense or interpreting differently the picked edition and it's just i think it's an interesting fact that a, a book or a text may have multiple versions or editions but it's not always the case sometimes the author makes the decision okay i throw away this manuscript and i only work on the next one so i mean that's it, it it's not like whether it's the editor that makes the decision or the author makes the decision somebody makes a decision what's going to be the the text to be shown but mm. it this doesn't limit us to a single reading of this text because the words interact differently with say with the experience of each reader or how it he or she puts the accent and so on so I don't know to what extent this is applicable to quantum physics at all, but it seems to me that if we are worried about going to the text, then we are actually caught caught up in a essentialist fear or position that, oh, I'm worried that I don't have access to all these other versions or other editions or previous, um, you know, variations of, of the poem or whatever. I mean, we don't have to have 
access to all of that in order to be active readers. We could be active readers with the finished product because it's not it's not so fixed. It's a text. It's open. So it's like it, what I'm saying is like kind of, I'm challenging you a little bit that to worry about the actual papers like versions of of the work is to worry about some physical material body that if you have a lot of bodies we're going to have a lot of meanings and i want to say well one physical body one book one poem is enough to allow for multiple meanings absolutely absolutely we can even ignore my points about the different editions my point is that we have to make the first we have to make the reader active, They're really active. And the second point is that we have to um, allow for ambiguity and polysemy, as you would mm -hmm. say. Yeah. So that is my point, and not necessarily different editions. Yeah. I, I, I come to think about, uh, I don't know if you remember, Kalle, that I, I think you do remember we had this Indian philosopher Nagarjuna to help us. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. And uh, he has this, oh, what is it called? Uh, Chandra, Chandra Kurtu, four truths. Mm. Mm. It is a, it's a sort of square. And it's a very different type of thinking. It's like we talked about the law of the excluded middle and that not being the case here. This is amplify that we have. We have A, this one part of the corner. We have B, we have both A and B, and we have neither A and B, none of them. Mm -hmm. So. At the same time, that if we're going to transfer that to, to your example there, Kalle and Asya, about the meaning of a text, mm -hmm. that would be that a text has only one meaning and it also has several meanings at the same time. Uh, and of course, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit <laughs> what we usually refer to as being that cannot be the case. <laughs> <laughs> so both uh, we have this text has only one meaning and nothing else. And this text has several meanings. And this is going on at the same time. And now still I'm only inferring to two corners of this square mm -hmm. with the four options then. So it's beyond normal uh, in inclusion of saying that we have both and they they are the sum of the both uh, particle and wave uh, is a sort of sum and that is reality well they're still completely contradictory we have either or and we also have and and i think mm -hmm. there i'm struggling now <laughs> as you can you can imagine <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I was now stuck into my observation or my reflection about the uh, killing three birds with one stone. Ah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> So actually, Schrödinger, he, so to say, he didn't kill, but he captured three cats in one box. <laughs> and then... Um, but then when you open the box, only one cat can come uh, out and the other two cats remain there. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's, uh, it's your observation, so to say, or your character, your mood, which decides which cat comes out. 
So if you are grumpy, and then the cat, uh, only the dead cats will come out, uh, mm -hmm. and the living cat will remain there, and also the, uh, the third cat, which is both dead and living, will also remain there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we have uh, uh, the Alice and Bob example that two people have different realities, basically completely different realities. Not observed realities, not interpreted realities, but scientific different realities. And this is another hard nut to crack or <laughs> it's very hard to digest as mm -hmm. you hear it goes against the intuitions of everyday thinking yeah yeah that's pretty radical <laughs> it is it is i think uh, one person i spoke to said taking in too much of quantum yeah. mechanics at one go can actually put you uh in serious uh uh, mental damage or uh, put put your mental health in peril. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I most certainly agree about that. And uh, Hans, I, I should mention also the <clears throat> Canadian American uh, philosopher with whom we had discussions. You had interviews. Um, 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 about uh, the. Um, um, at this time, um, we went through some of his books. Um, Rosé. Come, come again, again. Uh, what did you say? Uh, we went. Uh, I should mention also uh, this. Stephen M. Rosen, yeah. Canadian American philosopher, the whom you interviewed. Stephen Rosen, thank you. And and. Um, <clears throat> He had many good points. <clears throat> what oh. I did like, what I did, um, one great insight from one of his, his books, Stephen Rosen's books, was that uh, was about light. Um, um, so, what is important about light? We usually say we could say now somebody objects is not quantum physics. Doesn't it say that everything is relativity? Not there is no absolute truth, uh, or uh, that could be said that is there not? What is the ultimate truth? As Asia has asked earlier, is there not any ultimate truth or truth? Where is the truth? And I would say that there is, and we learned that from Stephen and Rosen namely about light, that light is always constant. That is, the, light is the only thing in the universe which is not relative. Has. <clears throat> mm, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 why not? Because yeah. it's always the same velocity. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was an important insight. So people say, no, no, okay, everything now is relative. We can do whatever we want. Uh, every mm. interpreter is possible, but no, that's not the case. Yes, much is relative, uh, is re relational, <laughs> relational. Everything is relational according to Carl Rovelli. But that there is actually one ultimate truth, and that relates to light. Yeah. That light is always constant, independent of an observer, independent of any observer. Mm. Would you? Uh, yeah, sure thing. Yeah, we yeah. Did that, yeah, that is an important thing we learned from Stephen Rosen. Yeah. Because uh, so, so we don't end in a, uh, in, that, uh, in, a, in, um, in this kind of approach that everything is possible now. Um, and kind of uh, relativist. Uh, that is one attack that has a claim that has been hurled against Derrida, for instance, that everything is now relativ uh, relativistic, but that is not the case. Everything is not, there is actually a truth that is relates to light. Mm -hmm. Light is the only thing in the universe which is not relativistic. <clears throat> I think that is a comforting thought. 
Yeah, and uh, yeah, sure, why not? And you can also maybe use the Nagarjuna thing that everything is absolutely absolute, stable, and everything is also relative. And at the same time, they are both. And that brings me into the maybe too complex here, but the Klein bubble where the subject, so to speak, entering to the objective reality. Can you do some work, Lampel, to our uh, new guest? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Put Give the camera. It's a, a clamp hotel is a wonderful discovery that actually Steven M. Rosen showed to us. <clears throat> yeah, it's a magnif magnificent thing. Uh, let's see, I'm going to put the camera on here. Give me a second here. Start video. Let's see here. Here we have it. Oh. This is a three dimensional projection of space. Wow. And uh, this is act the actual view of, uh, or closer to reality of, uh, of space. Okay. And wow. this is the subject entering into the, the enclosed space mm -hmm. and then exit. Wow. Yeah. And the odd thing about this, it has only one surface. It doesn't have several surfaces. <laughs> it's very hard to believe, but if you touch it, you understand, oh my God, it's only one surface. Oh. It's a flat thing, actually. And <laughs> despite its flatness, it can still hold liquid. So I could fill it up. Wow. But very hard to do it, but you can fill it up and use yes, it yes. as a graph. And it doesn't, the, the, the liquid doesn't come out from the... It doesn't come out. Wow. It's beyond belief. And this is how space works. It's the subject is constantly coming in and you have both the subject absolutely separated from the object or space. But at the same time, they are the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have either or and both. <laughs> and I would say, add to that, none of them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can you hold sure. up the clamp bottle again? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, actually, clamp bottle is very good to illustrate Schrodinger's cat. Uh -huh. uh, because it's, it's very difficult to imagine how an outside observer can actually influence whether the cat will live or die. Uh -huh. But here you can see, we could say that the outside observer, uh, outside within square brackets, is actually inside. So mm. we could say that, yes. um, what do you call that in English, the hand dog at that bar is actually the outside observer. Uh, and and um, and the cat is inside there, so they actually one of the same. The cat that observes exactly. Of the same. It's, yeah, <laughs> perfectly. But it's a very helpful tool. A very helpful tool. Wow, yeah, that's fascinating. Absolutely. Cass, um, may yeah. I ask you something unrelated? Where are you located geographically? Because this bright light is very interesting. Are you in the United States? I'm uh, in Sweden now. It's uh, uh, what latitude is it? Fifty-eight. So it's up uh -huh. north, north, north. I, I think it's fifty-eight. I, I'm not sure. I don't check it. Sorry. I see. Yeah. Really up north. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that probably explains the light, how bright it is. It's going to remain light for uh, yet another hour or two, I think, before. Yes. Uh... Wow. <laughs> it's pure daylight. Yes, yes, very interesting. <laughs> yes, uh, while uh, you are in Sweden, and now it's 9.30 in the evening, and I am in Greece, it's 10.30. Yeah, here. same here, uh, <laughs> and it's very yeah. dark already. Ah, oh, yeah, I can well imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I can well imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, may maybe we should round up there. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and there. Kalle, do you have anything else to add? No, no, let's end there. And uh, perhaps we can end with a great laugh.
uh, thinking about the Grumpy Observer who comes, who didn't get his coffee, and then uh, finds the cat dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we influence reality. It's it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Poor cat. Poor cat. <laughs> <laughs> Poor cat. I didn't get my coffee. The cat is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope you, you, you like to participate in this experiment. And uh, I have a look through it. And if you want to, I can publish it uh, as well. Yes, absolutely. Do it. <clears throat> to keep it light, uh, not so many tough words, to give an introduction to quantum mechanics and how we felt about the whole thing and <laughs> how it was to approach it. Absolutely. Give it a great title so it attracts people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like uh, Serenius Cat, uh, a tree, uh, to kill three cats with one uh, box. <laughs> <laughs> great color. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank, thank you very much for joining us uh, you. and Kalle. Thank you. It was thank a privilege having you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Have a good, good night. night. Good good night. Bye bye. And bye everyone for thank you for listening in. Have a good morning, day or afternoon, wherever you are. Bye bye for now. <laughs>